Glad you can make it on such short notice. We head to the upper Coromandel to do diving, fishing and camping. But first we're going to stop in Coromandel town, head into Top Catch and grab some bait. Which are basically piper if you know what they are. A big section of the drive north consists of this gravel road. Beautiful terrain, looping around the coast into magnificent bays covered in pahuta kawa trees and often very steep drop offs. The wind this day is blowing from north to south, so as opposed to getting right up the north of the peninsula to Port Jackson or Fletcher's Bay, we're pulling into Fantail Bay. On the west coast, a little bit off the tip, still magnificent diving and fishing in this area. Scouting out your dive site is a very important part of spearfishing. You want to be able to make a plan beforehand. Get a good feel for the environmental factors at play. Think about the wind, think about the tide, Think about the swell, think about the chop, and any other factors it may present. We brought very little food with us, so when this goat fish presented itself, I didn't muck around and I plugged it. When you're diving an unfamiliar spot, and you're not sure what you're going to run into, and you need to get a feed for that night, you can't be too picky. My plan is, shoot a couple of these, get some meat sorted out then go for something a little bit more difficult secure a feed beforehand and then worry about getting the trophy fish that's cool. what is it? goat fish Sweet. easy fish but decided if I don't see anything else this is complete dinner uh. spear fishing in dirty water can be very difficult so I'm sticking to a style of diving that I've done a lot of weed line diving I know when I dive down here on the weed line looking for goat fish they're generally going to be on the sand side this one wasn't, he was on the kelp. I wasn't able to get away a shot because he was in the rocks and didn't want to damage my shot. But I'm sticking to a style of diving I'm very familiar with on a fish I'm familiar with and I get the results. If it's dirty water, you want to do everything you can to be able to predict where that fish is going to be. While they're not a particularly challenging fish to hunt or to shoot, I really enjoy hunting goat fish. Getting down to the bottom, laying flat and letting them come into you. That's all the technique it really takes to get these guys a lot of the time. And they're also brilliantly tasty fish. We're going to cook these ones up whole. Whole fried goat fish. Absolutely beautiful. When you're targeting goat fish out on the weed lines, also keep an eye out for John Dory. Oftentimes I've shot John Dory's around schools of small goat fish. When you hang out on the sand in groups, if you check around the peripheries in the weeds, oftentimes, if you look hard enough, there will be a John Dory or two lurking in the area. A welcome bycatch, certainly. Hold on to this one's got chuck in the float boat. And keep going that way, if you can. Admittedly, I didn't have very high hopes for this dive. There is some pirori here that I was eyeing up. I told some campers that I was getting them some fish. However, I don't think pirori is going to cut it. While it's a fish that I don't mind personally, it's not something that's highly prized in the eyes of other people, so I don't think it would make a very good gift. Luckily, this blue moki came in to say hi. I managed to get a shot away just as he was turning, a really long shot. I was using longer bands of my gun, powered it down a bit for the dirty water, and this was a long shot on a decent fish, so I wasn't sure if I had full penetration or what the story was. Really, even where my shot had gone in. All I'd known is I'd hit the fish. Yeah, boy! So I get to the surface, and I do my best to play it out. Once the fish manages to tie out a bit, I start bringing him up to the surface, only slowly, not putting too much tension on the line. If I'm sure of my shot, I'm going to generally horse it up as fast as I can, try to get it away, stop any entanglement, stop any other predators coming in and stealing my catch. But if you don't know about your shot, you got to play it easy. Don't want to lose the fish. I really am very grateful that this fish swam by when it did. This fish went on to feed myself, my friend who I had come up here with, and two other campers for a couple meals really good turn of circumstances here absolutely stoked 
Blue Moki are great eating fish. I would consider them to be above both Red Moki and Copper Moki in eating quality. The plan this trip was to catch only what we were going to eat while we're here. While I could have gone and tried to get another one, it would have honestly just gone to waste. This here was plenty enough and that kind of put it into shooting fish for the day. However, while we're out here, we're still going to enjoy it and have a great time. This was my friend Cade's first time actually properly coming out for a dive. First time holding a spear gun, first time putting on the big long fins, and first time out here in the water in the Coromandel. So it was a really cool experience to be able to take him out here. Yeah, it's good, cool. I'll chuck this in the flight and I'll be with you, eh? Most often when I see blue moki, I won't shoot them. It's not that I don't like eating them, but honestly, they're pretty docile for the most part. A lot of times they'll swim up and just check you out. This one made things a little bit more difficult. However, a lot of the time you're just not going to get the same thrill you would from hunting a more intelligent fish. Like hunting trevallies, snappers or kingfish, you get more of a rush because they act quite elusive. While blue mokies often will swim straight up to you. However, I do like the occasional one. You get a lot of meat off them. Here in New Zealand, sea urchins, or kinna as we call them, are very abundant, tasty, and easy to harvest, provided you have gloves. This day, I had lent my good pair to Cade and used some gardening gloves. However, the material on them went really sticky and was getting all over my gun and GoPro housing. So I opted for no gloves, which made cracking open kinners and eating them a little bit more daunting than usual. However, it was interesting to get a lot of feel for the environment around you. When you're covered up in neoprene, you're wearing gloves, you're wearing socks, you're wearing a 5 mil wetsuit, you really do feel a bit detached from the environment. Taking your gloves off kind of takes you back there. This may be something I'll do more of in the future. However, obviously you are running the risk of injuring yourself on fish spines, on kinna, and on rocks. So it is a consideration you need to take. When you're just starting out with diving or spearfishing, the most important thing you can have is an open mind. Being open to experiences and being willing to try new things. Try this. Is it edible right now? Yeah. Just get into your mouth. Yeah, bro. I kind of like it, eh? It's good. Sure, it's kind of. At first, I put it on my gun, but it's almost like this one. But nah, that's me. Now I'm showing Cade how to open a kinner. Kinners have toxic spines in them. While in all the time I've been diving, I've never really got done, they can be quite nasty. I've known people have stepped on them, kicked them, and sometimes it's gone pretty bad. Like doctor's visits trying to dig them out. That's a pretty shit one, it's like real dark on the inside, and small. We get the ones that are like white and creamy and fat, that's oh, yeah. the ones you're after. Okay. We'll just pass them on the float boat. When you're looking between species, the size of the fish has very little correlation to the size of the scales. A large fish, let's say a kingfish or a marlin, they generally have very small scales. However, this goatfish has surprisingly large scales for the size, things that you'd see on quite decent snapper. This is good, it means we can scale it really easily and cook it whole without too much hassle. Almost always I'm gonna bleed my fish straight away. After that, before I head in, I'm going to gut them and take the gills out. Doing it without gloves feels a bit weird. The strategy that I use to open Kenner is getting my dive knife, plunging it through the bottom middle, all the way to the hilt and then twisting it. This will generally pop the kinna right in half. All the way in bro. However you need to get the knife right down to the base for this to be an effective technique. That one's fat as. I don't even know what's the end of the So if you shake it underwater most of the other crap goes out. 
Saw a little bit of the Kinner Row come out, and of course we're not going to waste that delicious little morsel. I quickly boost over to intercept before Hungry Fish comes along and snaffles it. What a strange creature. Uh, oh yeah. Bro, right, that's me. At this point in the dive, I decide to let Cade have a try with the gun. Try shooting off the first time and see what happens. <laughs> Okay, the only thing you need to be careful about is shooting into rocks. What's up? Just be careful if it goes down too much at all, you need to shoot a rock. Yeah, that's what I was thinking about. I'll, <laughs> I'll throw it out that way. I chuck the canner out again into deeper water, and he takes a shot. You can see here, almost no recoil. That's why I love roller guns, one of the many reasons. A beginner, first time shooting spear gun can use it, and have virtually no recoil. How crazy is that? Personally, I'm not a huge fan of sand. I don't like finding sand everywhere and getting it all over my gear. However, boulder beaches are even harder to walk across. We got a nice haul of Kaimawana today. We didn't go overboard, we got enough for a feed, and we plan on sharing with some other campers that are staying near us. We've got Kinna, Goatfish, and Blue Moki. What an awesome feed. Really grateful for all of these creatures for sacrificing themselves to our mission. Here we're just going to do a young photo show, shoot with the blue moki. When you're taking photos of fish, you want to be holding out in front of you, pretty much as far as you can. You want to make your fish look big. It might seem disingenuous. It's not really because every mouse is doing it. Make your fish look good. This one's going on whole way. Yeah. Do you have tutorials on your uh, YouTube channel? Not really any tutorials, honestly. Because I was thinking, I was out there like asking a whole bunch of questions just about spearfishing in general. Probably not the greatest time to ask while it's happening, <laughs> but you know. I mean, that's when the questions come up. It's hard to like know what you want to know before you're out there. Mm. What do we got here? This is a curry mix. Turmeric cumin seeds. I'm going. <laughs> I'm going. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> and this is cyan pepper. Get a good bit of that on there. Alright, it's already looking mean. I want to get a bit intimate with it. I want to get it right in all those flaps there. Yeah. I kind of feel like I'm filming a porno right now. <laughs> so we do it on blue neoprene and fuck our fish. Thanks for driving us all the way out here, bro. It's all good, bro. Now it's time for some cooking. We're gonna chuck the pan on top of the portable gas cooking and get some oil in there. Get it nice and hot, wait till the oil is smoking, then you can chuck your fish in and it's gonna have plenty of heat to get that good crisp. Taking the goods. Bad boys. Dang, they're actually pretty big ones you put them in a pan, eh? Oh, that one is. Oh, not so much. What's the size for these fish? What's that? What's the size? Minimum size? No minimum size. But they don't get much bigger than that one there. How's that fucking look? It looks, looks mean. mean. My opinion, my humble, unbiased opinion. Man, there's just something about the sound of fish frying on the pan. That beautiful sizzling sound. It sounds like diamond raindrops. Falling from the heavens. M -m 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 money shot. Damn, it's gonna crisp and yum.
开通了，开通了。Try a bit of this. No much. Oh, skin's crispy. Mmm. That's good. Good eye. <laughs> Sussed. Cooking your fish whole is a great way to get all of the meat off the fish. Waste not, want not. Eat heaps and waste fuck all. When you give your friend a hammock, let them tie the knots. If they fall in the night, you don't want it to be your responsibility. Same goes for boats. I always try avoid putting the anchor down on people's boats because I don't want to be responsible for it. It's a little tip for you. How's that? Effective spearfishing is a combination of many different skills. There's obvious ones like free diving and actually hunting fish, and then less obvious ones. Things like reading the weather and filleting your fish up afterwards. Learning how to fillet fish effectively is something I would encourage you to learn how to do. Look up videos, get a bunch of fish, fillet them up, do whatever you can to increase that skill because that's how you waste less fish. If you care about the ocean, learning how to fillet your fish effectively as well as utilizing as much of the fish as you can within reason is one of the greatest things that you can be doing. When you're filleting fish, you don't have to be fast. The main objective is getting as much meat off the fish's skeleton as you can. When you go fast, you increase the chance of hurting yourself. Having a sharp knife when you're filleting fish is very, very important. The less force you're actually using on the fish, the less chance there is of the blade slipping, and the less chance there is of you cutting yourself. It may seem counterintuitive, but a sharper knife is safer. We're going to just check on that for now? Yeah, it's fine. The knife that I'm using today to cut this fish is a Burns Co. 9 inch filleting knife. It has a very flexible blade, really good for cutting down the length of the fish as it almost contours to the backbone. Yeah, dude, I'm getting more of that Kawako and putting it on. It's actually worked. However, it doesn't excel particularly well in cutting through bone. It has a very thin blade and the knife edge is like very thin at that, so it requires a bit of meat. Every different species that you get will have a different bone structure. Even animals of the same species often vary quite a bit. While there are a lot of variations, most of what you're doing is the same across the board. There are a few notable exceptions. Fish such as stargazers and flounders require a different approach. However, I'm sure with enough practice, you could do them efficiently and quickly. When you're filleting a fish, you're not just trying to get the meat off the fish. You're trying to get that fillet off in as clean a way as possible. That means trying to avoid the gut cavity, trying to avoid getting scales on the meat, and trying to avoid sand, any dirt. Take care of your fillets and they'll last a lot longer. I'll try to get that in the sun so you can see like the light coming through it. It's like a little alien. The tail on them as well. I've been like keeping all the tails from fish I've shot recently. Oh yeah, always that? Like, drying them out. They're just cool. They make good like good presents or gifts and shit as well. Oh yeah. So I'll try to dry this out tomorrow. We persevere. We try our best to utilize as much of the fish as possible. And what doesn't get used by us is returned back to the Moana, to enter the cycle once again. We didn't have the realistic means to eat all of this fish in the time we were here. So to ensure it didn't get wasted, we returned what we wouldn't eat. One of the fillets, the whole half of the fish basically, we gave to some other campers so they could enjoy it. can see it the summer longest. Oh, I just put the shades on. We don't always smoke, but when we do, it's just to celebrate a successful day, another beautiful day on a beautiful planet, doing beautiful things. 
surround yourself with great people in great places. And you're sure to have a great time in life. Give us a slingshot. What a place to be. Golden right boy. place at the right time. Yeah. And it makes for beautiful memories. Oh, no, nice Sitting here fishing as the sun goes down. Spectacular in its own right. We gave it a decent shot, we would have been there maybe half an hour to an hour. Gave it a fair crack, but no bites. But hey, it's fishing, not catching. Just signing up to be out there for a good time, it's a bonus if you catch something or not. Same with spear fishing. Next morning, nice early start. We're gonna scout it out, see what the beach is like, and now we're gonna have a little bit of a cook up. This is some of the blue murky from last night. We cooked some up with some noodles that night. It's too dark to film anything, so here's the next morning. We got them seasoned up, curry mix, and cyan pepper. Get it nice and spicy. We're gonna get it on there, nice fry it up. When you're cooking fish, if you're aiming to get it crispy, you need to be cooking at a high temperature. Make sure you get a good sizzle, crisp on the outside, but you're not trying to overcook the middle. Fish is really easy to overcook. To avoid overcooking, if you're cooking it in large fillets like these ones, they don't cook through quite as quick. So you can more reliably get a good sear, good sear bite on the outside, while keeping it inside nice, moist, tender, which is pretty much what you're looking for. So where fish goes wrong, a lot of people can make the mistake of overcooking it. You can't undercook fish, but you can overcook it. It's always a very cool experience to be eating the fish you caught in the wild, in the wild. Being basically at the spot where the fish was killed, where it lived potentially a lot of its life, and eating it there. Something special, it comes full circle. I'm glad we could be there to enjoy it. After that we decided to pull the pin, leave camp, head up the coast a bit and see if we could find any nice spots for a dive. Always ready to film. It was relatively flat around here, however, the water visibility was pretty lacking. We just did an overnight mission this time, it was more or less a trial run for things to come. So on the next morning we weren't hugely fussed about a dive, we said hey if it looks better than it did yesterday we'll hop in, if not we're not too fast. We continue on the Port Jackson Road to get up the hill. Cade's never been to this part of the Coromandel before so I was eager to show him around. I used to camp here quite a bit back in the day. The road leading up to it is pretty treacherous, it's real narrow and it's often got pretty steep drop offs. We had like one sketchy encounter with like a big truck and a trailer, but it worked out. This northern area of the Coromandel is beautiful, and it's one of the most remote untouched areas still around in New Zealand. West coast Coromandel is pretty much this really straight long road follows the whole thing and stops off at some really beautiful little towns and areas that you can go to. I reckon it's probably like the nicest road in the Coromandel. There's no huge expansive white sand beaches but it's got a lot to offer. The two coasts of the Coromandel differ quite a bit geographically. The east coast of the Coromandel is a lot more exposed, facing outwards to the ocean with little protection. Because of that it gets a lot of wave activity. Beaches on the east coast are white sand. Being behind a cyclist can be annoying, but I would advise you, don't overtake them on corners. You're not just endangering them, but also yourself and the passengers you're in the vehicle with. There was a lot of dust in my car, so I wrote, protect our ocean. Unfortunately, as you can see, it didn't last very long. However, it's a message that I carry with me everywhere I go. As far as diving goes, it doesn't get much worse in temps. However, it's got a lot of cool history. Did you know that you can eat dandelions? I found out recently, I think they're quite tasty. This stretch of road is really cool. As you come over the Copahic Way and get onto the Tyro side, it's a mountain that leads into a valley and has a super long stretch of road. Really beautiful scenery. We make it back to Tyra and this is what we're seeing on the east coast, getting thrashed. That's why we decided to go for a big mission and hit the west coast where it was more sheltered. Thanks for watching. This episode's sustainability message is don't catch more than you're going to eat.